Section four of Madam How and Lady Why. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Esther. Madam How and Lady Why by Charles Kingsley. Section four, chapter three, volcanoes. You want to know why the Spaniards in Peru and Ecuador should have expected an earthquake because they had had so many already. The shaking of the ground in their country had gone on perpetually till they had almost ceased to care about it, always hoping that no very heavy shock would come, and being now and then terribly mistaken. For instance, in the province of Quito, in the year 1797, from thirty to forty thousand people were killed at once by an earthquake. One would have thought that warning enough, but the warning was not taken, and now, this very year, thousands more have been killed in the very same country, in the very same way. They might have expected as much, for their towns are built, most of them, close to volcanoes, some of the highest and most terrible in the world. And whenever there are volcanoes, there will be earthquakes. You may have earthquakes without volcanoes now and then, but volcanoes without earthquakes seldom or never. How does that come to pass? Does a volcano make earthquakes? No, we may rather say that earthquakes are trying to make volcanoes, for volcanoes are the holes which the steam underground has burst open that it may escape into the air above. They are the chimneys of the great blast furnaces underground, in which Madame Howe pounds and melts the old rocks to make them into new ones and spread them out over the land above. And are there many volcanoes in the world? You have heard of Vesuvius, of course, in Italy, and Etna in Sicily, and Hecla in Iceland, and you have heard, too, of Kilauea in the Sandwich Islands, and of Pele's hair, the yellow threads of lava, like fine-spun glass, which are blown off from its pools of fire, and which the Sandwich Islanders believe to be the hair of a goddess who lived in the crater. And you have read, too, I hope, in Miss Young's book of Golden Deeds, the noble story of the Christian chieftainess, who, in order to persuade her subjects to become Christians also, went down into the crater and defied the goddess of the volcano, and came back unhurt and triumphant. But if you look at the map, you will see that there are many, many more. Get Keith Johnston's physical atlas from the schoolroom. Of course it is there, for a schoolroom without a physical atlas is like a needle without an eye. And look at the map, which is called Phenomena of Volcanic Action. You will see in it many red dots, which mark the volcanoes which are still burning, and black dots, which mark those which have been burning at some time or other, not very long ago, scattered about the world. Sometimes they are single, like the red dot at Otaheite, or at Easter Island in the Pacific. Sometimes they are in groups or clusters, like the cluster at the Sandwich Islands, or in the Friendly Islands, or in New Zealand. And if we look at the Atlantic, we shall see four clusters, one in poor, half-destroyed Iceland, in the far north, one in the Azores, one in the Canaries, and one in the Cape de Verde. And there is one dot in those Canaries, which we must not overlook, for it is no other than the famous peak of Tenerife, a volcano which is hardly burnt out yet, and may burn up again any day, standing up out of the sea, more than twelve thousand feet high still, and once it must have been double that height. Some think that it is, perhaps, the true Mount Atlas, which the old Greeks named when first they ventured out of the Straits of Gibraltar, down the coast of Africa, and saw the great peak far to the westward, with the clouds cutting off its top, and said that it was a mighty giant, the brother of the evening star, who held up the sky upon his shoulders, in the midst of the fortunate islands, the gardens of the daughter of the evening star, full of strange golden fruits, and that Perseus had turned him into stone, when he passed him with the gorgon's head. But you will see, too, that most of these red and black dots run in crooked lines, and that many of the clusters run in lines likewise. Look at one line, by far the largest on the earth, you will learn a good deal of geography from it. The red dots begin at a place called the Terribles, on the east side of the Bay of Bengal. They run on, here and there, along the islands of Sumatra and Java, 
and through the Spice Islands, and at New Guinea, the line of red dots, forks. One branch runs southeast, through the islands whose names you never heard, to the Friendly Islands, and to New Zealand. The other runs north, through the Philippines, through Japan, through Kamchatka, and then there is a little break of sea, between Asia and America, but beyond it the red dots begin again in the Aleutian Islands, and then turn down the whole west coast of America, down from Mount Elias, in what was, till lately, Russian America, towards British Columbia. Then, after a long gap, there are one or two in Lower California, and we must not forget the terrible earthquake which has just shaken San Francisco between those two last places. And when we come down to Mexico, we find the red dots again plentiful, and only too plentiful, for they mark the great volcanic line of Mexico, of which you will read, I hope, some day, in Humboldt's works. But the line does not stop there. After the little gap of the Isthmus of Panama, it begins again in Quito, the very country which has just been shaken, and in which stand the huge volcanoes, Chimborazo, Pasto, Antisana, Cotopaxi, Pichincha, Tunguraga, smooth cones from 15,000 to 20,000 feet high, shining white with snow, till the heat inside melts it off, and leaves the cinders of which the peaks are made all black and ugly among the clouds, ready to burst in smoke and fire. South of them there is a long gap, and then another line of red dots, Arequiba, Chipicane, Gualateri, Atacama, as high as or higher than those in Quito, and this, remember, is the other country which has just been shaken. On the seashore, below those volcanoes, stood the hapless city of Arica, whose ruins we saw in the picture. Then comes another gap, and then a line of more volcanoes in Chile, at the foot of which happened that fearful earthquake of 1835, besides many more, of which you will read some day in that noble book, The Voyage of the Beagle. And so the line of dots runs down to the southernmost point of America. What a line we have traced, long enough to go round the world if it were straight, a line of holes out of which steam and heat and cinders and melted stones are rushing up perpetually in one place and another. Now the holes in this line, which are near each other, have certainly something to do with each other. For instance, when the earth shook the other day round the volcanoes of Quito, it shook also round the volcanoes of Peru, though they were six hundred miles away. And there are many stories of earthquakes being felt, or awful underground thunder heard, while volcanoes were breaking out hundreds of miles away. I will give you a very curious instance of that. If you look at the West Indies on the map, you will see a line of red dots runs through the Windward Islands. There are two volcanoes in them, one in Guadalupe and one in St. Vincent. I will tell you a curious story presently about the last one. And little volcanoes, if they have ever been real volcanoes at all, which now only send out mud in Trinidad. There the red dots stop but then begins along the north coast of South America a line of mountain country called Cumana and Caracas, which has often been horribly shaken by earthquakes. Now once, when the volcano in St. Vincent began to pour out a vast stream of melted lava, a noise like thunder was heard underground over thousands of square miles beyond those mountains, in the plains of Calabozo, and on the banks of the Apure, more than six hundred miles away from the volcano, a plain sign that there was something underground which joined them together, perhaps a long crack in the earth. Look for yourselves at the places, and you will see that, as Humboldt says, it is as strange as if an eruption of Mount Vesuvius was heard in the north of France. So it seems as if these lines of volcanoes stood along cracks in the rind of the earth, through which the melted stuff inside was forever trying to force its way, and that, as the crack got stopped up in one place by the melted stuff cooling and hardening again into stone, it was burst in another place and a fresh volcano made, or an old one reopened. Now we can understand why earthquakes should be most common round volcanoes, and we can understand, too, 
why they would be worse before a volcano breaks out, because then the steam is trying to escape, and we can understand, too, why people who live near volcanoes are glad to see them blazing and spouting, because then they have hope that the steam has found its way out and will not make earthquakes any more for a while. But still, that is merely foolish speculation on chance. Volcanoes can never be trusted. No one knows when they will break out or what they will do. And those who live close to them, as the city of Naples is close to Mount Vesuvius, must not be astonished if they are blown up or swallowed up, as that great and beautiful city of Naples may be without a warning any day. For what happened to that same Mount Vesuvius nearly 1,800 years ago in the old Roman times? For ages and ages it had been lying quiet like any other hill. Beautiful cities were built at its foot, filled with people who were as handsome and as comfortable and, I'm afraid, as wicked as people ever were on earth. Fair gardens, vineyards, olive yards covered the mountain slopes. It was held to be one of the paradises of the world. As for the mountains being a burning mountain, whoever thought of that? To be sure, on the top of it was a great round crater or cup, a mile or more across, and a few hundred yards deep. But that was all overgrown with bushes and wild vines, full of boars and deer. What sign of fire was there in that? To be sure, also, there was an ugly place below, by the seashore, called the Flagarian Fields, where smoke and brimstone came out of the ground, and a lake called Avernus, over which poisonous gases hung, and which, old stories told, was one of the mouths of the nether pit. But what of that? It had never harmed anyone, and how could it harm them? So they all lived on, merrily and happy enough, till in the year A.D. 79, that was eight years, you know, after the Roman Emperor Titus destroyed Jerusalem. There was stationed in the Bay of Naples a Roman admiral called Pliny, who was also a very studious and learned man, and author of a famous old book on natural history. He was staying on shore with his sister, and as he sat in his study, she called him out to see a strange cloud which had been hanging for some time over the top of Mount Vesuvius. It was in shape just like a pine tree, not, of course, like one of our branching Scotch ferns here, but like an Italian stone pine, with a long straight stem and a flat parasol-shaped top. Sometimes it was blackish, sometimes spotted, and the good Admiral Pliny, who was always curious about natural science, ordered his cutter and went away across the bay to see what it could be. Earthquake shocks had been very common for the last few days, but I do not suppose that Pliny had any notion that the earthquakes and the cloud had aught to do with each other. However, he soon found out that they had, and to his cost. When he got near the opposite shore, some of the sailors met him and entreated him to turn back. Cinders and pumice stones were falling down from the sky, and flames breaking out of the mountain above. But Pliny would go on. He said that if people were in danger, it was his duty to help them and that he must see this strange cloud and note the different shapes into which it changed. But the hot ashes fell faster and faster. The sea ebbed out suddenly and left them nearly dry, and Pliny turned away to a place called Stabia, to the house of his friend Pomponianus, who was just going to escape in a boat. Brave Pliny told him not to be afraid, ordered his bath like a true Roman gentleman, and then went into dinner with a cheerful face. Flames came down from the mountain, nearer and nearer as the night drew on, but Pliny persuaded his friend that they were only fires in some villages from which the peasants had fled, and then went to bed and slept soundly. However, in the middle of the night they found the courtyard being fast filled with cinders, and if they had not woke up the admiral in time, he would never have been able to get out of the house. The earthquake shocks grew stronger and fiercer, till the house was ready to fall, and Pliny and his friend and the sailors and the slaves all fled into the open fields amid a shower of stones and cinders, tying pillows over their heads to prevent their being beaten down. The day had come by this time, but not the dawn, for it was still pitch dark as night. They went down to their boats upon the shore, but the sea raged so horribly that there was no getting on board of them. Then Pliny grew tired, 
and made his men spread a sail for him and lay down on it. But there came down upon them a rush of flames and a horrible smell of sulphur, and all ran for their lives. Some of the slaves tried to help the admiral upon his legs, but he sank down again, overpowered with the brimstone fumes, and so was left behind. When they came back again, there he lay dead, but with his clothes in order, and his face as quiet as if he had only been sleeping. And that was the end of a brave and learned man, a martyr to duty, and to the love of science. But what was going on in the meantime? Under clouds of ashes, cinders, mud, lava, three of those happy cities were buried at once. Herculaneum, Pompeii, Stabia, they were buried, just as the people had fled from them, leaving the furniture and the earthenware, often even jewels and gold, behind, and here and there among them a human being, who had not had time to escape from the dreadful deluge of dust. The ruins of Herculaneum and Pompeii have been dug into since, and the paintings, especially in Pompeii, are found upon the walls still fresh, preserved from the air by the ashes which had covered them in. When you are older, perhaps you will go to Naples and see in its famous museum the curiosities which have been dug out of the ruined cities, and you will walk, I suppose, along the streets of Pompeii and see the wheel-tracks in the pavement along which carts and chariots rumbled two thousand years ago. Meanwhile, if you go nearer to home, to the Crystal Palace and to the Pompeian Court, as it is called, you will see an exact model of one of these old buried houses copied even to the very paintings on the walls, and judge for yourself, as far as a little boy can judge, what sort of life these thoughtless, luckless people lived two thousand years ago. And what had become of Vesuvius, the treacherous mountain? Half or more than half of the side of the old crater had been blown away, and what was left, which is now called the Mount Salma, stands in a half-circle round the new cone, and a new crater which is burning at this very day. True, after that eruption which killed Pliny, Vesuvius fell asleep again and did not wake for a hundred and thirty-four years, and then again for two hundred and sixty-nine years, but it has been growing more and more restless as the ages have passed on, and now hardly a year passes without its sending out smoke and stones from its crater, and streams of lava from its sides. And now, I suppose, you will want to know what a volcano is like, and what a cone and a crater and lava are. What a volcano is like, it is easy enough to show you, for they are the most simply and beautifully shaped of all the mountains, and they are all alike all over the world, whether they be large or small. Every volcano in the world, I believe, is, or has been once, of the shape which you see in the drawing opposite. Even those volcanoes in the Sandwich Islands, of which you have often heard, which are now great lakes of boiling fire upon flat downs, without any cone to them at all. They, I believe, are volcanoes which have fallen in ages ago, just as in Java a whole burning mountain fell in on the night of the 11th of August in the year 1772. Then, after a short and terrible earthquake, a bright cloud suddenly covered the whole mountain. The people who dwelt around it tried to escape. But before the poor souls could get away, the earth sunk beneath their feet, and the whole mountain fell in and was swallowed up with a noise as if a great cannon were being fired. Forty villages and nearly three thousand people were destroyed, and where the mountain had been was only a plain of red-hot stones. In the same way, in the year 1698, the top of the mountain in Quito fell in in a single night, leaving only two immense peaks of rock behind, and pouring out great floods of mud mixed with dead fish, for there are underground lakes among these volcanoes which swarm with little fish which never see the light. But most volcanoes, as I say, are, or have been, the shape of the one which you see here. This is Cotopaxi, in Quito, more than 19,000 feet in height. All those sloping sides are made of cinders and ashes, braced together, I suppose, by bars of solid lava stone inside, which prevent the whole from crumbling down. The upper part, you see, is white with snow, as far down as a line which is 15,000 feet above the sea. 
for the mountain is in the tropics close to the equator and the snow will not lie in that hot climate any lower down but now and then the snow melts off and rushes down the mountain side in floods of water and of mud and the cindery cone of cotopaxi stands out black and dreadful against the clear blue sky and then the people of that country know what is coming the mountain is growing so hot inside that it melts off its snowy covering and soon it will burst forth with smoke and steam and red-hot stones and earthquakes which will shake the ground and roars that will be heard it may be hundreds of miles away and now for the words cone crater lava if i can make you understand those words you will see why volcanoes must be in general of the shape of cotopaxi cone crater lava those words make up the alphabet of volcano learning the cone is the outside of a huge chimney the crater is the mouth of it the lava is the ore which is being melted in the furnace below that it may flow out over the surface of the old land and make new land instead and where is the furnace itself who can tell that under the roots of the mountains under the depths of the sea down the paths which no fowl knoweth and which the vulture's eye hath not seen the lion's whelp hath not trodden it nor the fierce lion passed by it there he putteth forth his hand upon the rock he overturneth the mountain by the roots he cutteth out rivers among the rocks and his eye seeth every precious thing while we like ants run up and down outside the earth scratching like ants a few feet down and calling that a deep ravine or peeping a few feet down into the crater of a volcano unable to guess what precious things may lie below below even the fire which blazes and roars up through the thin crust of the earth for of the inside of this earth we know nothing whatsoever we only know that it is on an average several times as heavy as solid rock but how that can be we know not so let us look at the chimney and what comes out of it for we can see very little more why is a volcano like a cone for the same cause for which a molehill is like a cone though a very rough one and that the little heaps which the burrowing beetles make on the moor or which the ant-lions in france make in the sand are all something in the shape of a cone with a hole like a crater in the middle what the beetle and the ant-lion do on a very little scale the steam inside the earth does on a great scale when once it has formed a vent into the outside air it tears out the rocks underground grinds them small against each other often into the finest dust and blasts them out of the hole which it has made some of them fall back into the hole and are shot out again but most of them fall around the hole most of them close to it and a few of them further off till they are piled up in a ring around it just as the sand is piled up round a beetle's burrow for days and weeks and months this goes on even it may be for hundreds of years till a great cone is formed round the steam vent hundreds or thousands of feet in height of dust and stones and of cinders likewise for we recollect that when the steam has blown away the cold earth and rock near the surface of the ground it begins blowing out the hot rocks down below red hot white hot and at last actually melted but these as they are hurled into the cool air above become ashes cinders and blocks of stone again making the hill on which they fall bigger and bigger continually and thus does wise madam howe stand in no need of bricklayers but makes her chimneys build themselves and why is the mouth of the chimney called a crater crater as you know is greek for a cup and the mouth of these chimneys when they have become choked and stopped working are often just in the shape of a cup or as the germans call them kessels which means kettles or cauldrons i have seen some of them as beautifully and exactly rounded as if a cunning engineer had planned them and had dug them out with the spade at first of course their sides and bottom are nothing but loose stones cinders slag ashes such as would be thrown out of a furnace but madam how who whenever she makes an ugly desolate place tries to cover over its ugliness 
and set something green to grow over it and make it pretty once more does so often and often by her worn-out craters i have seen them covered with short sweet turf like so many chalk downs i have seen them too filled with bushes which held woodcocks and wild boars once i came on a beautiful round crater on the top of a mountain which was filled at the bottom with a splendid crop of potatoes though madame howe had not put them there herself she had at least taught the honest germans to put them there and often madame howe turns her worn-out craters into beautiful lakes there are many such crater lakes in italy as you will see if you ever go there as you may see in english galleries painted by wilson a famous artist who died before you were born you recollect lord macaulay's ballad the battle of the lake regulus then that lake regulus if i recollect right is one of these round crater lakes many such deep clear blue lakes have i seen in the eiffel in germany and many a curious plant have i picked on their shores where once the steam blasted and the earthquake roared and the ash clouds rushed up high into the heaven and buried all the land around in dust which is now fertile soil and long did i puzzle to find out why the water stood in some craters while others within a mile of them perhaps were perfectly dry that i never found out for myself but learned men tell me that the ashes which fall back into the crater if the bottom of it be wet from rain will sometimes set as it is called into a hard cement and so make the bottom of the great bowl waterproof as if it were made of earthenware but what gives the craters this cup shape at first while the steam and stones are being blown out the crater is an open funnel with more or less upright walls inside as the steam grows weaker fewer and fewer stones fall outside and more and more fall back again inside at last they quite choke up the bottom of the great round hole perhaps too the lava or melted rock underneath cools and grows hard and that chokes up the hole lower down then down from the round edge of the crater the stones and cinders roll inward more and more the rains wash them down the wind blows them down they roll to the middle and meet each other and stop and so gradually the steep funnel becomes a round cup you may prove for yourself that it must be so if you will try do you not know that if you dig a round hole in the ground and leave it to crumble in it is sure to become cup-shaped at last though at first its sides may have been quite upright like those of a bucket if you do not know get a trowel and make your own little experiment and now you ought to understand what cone and crater mean and more if you will think for yourself you may guess what would come out of a volcano when it broke out in an eruption as it is usually called first clouds of steam and dust what you would call smoke then volleys of stone some cool some burning hot and at last because it lies lowest of all the melted rock itself which is called lava and where would that come out at the top of the chimney at the top of the cone no madam howe as i told you usually makes things make themselves she has made the chimney of the furnace make itself and next she will make the furnace door make itself the melted lava rises in the crater the funnel inside the cone but it never gets to the top it is so enormously heavy that the sides of the cone cannot bear its weight and give way low down and then through ashes and cinders the melted lava burrows out twisting and turning like an enormous fiery earthworm till it gets to the air outside and runs off down the mountain in a stream of fire and so you may see as are to be seen on vesuvius now two eruptions at once one of the burning stones above and one of melted lava below and what is lava that i think i must tell you another time for when i speak of it i shall have to tell you more about madame howe and her ways of making the ground on which you stand than i can say just now but if you want to know as i dare say you do what the eruption of a volcano is like you may read what follows I did not see it happen, for I never had the good fortune of seeing a mountain burning, though I have seen many and many a one which has been burnt, extinct volcanoes, as they are called. The man who saw it, a very good friend of mine, and a very good man of science also, 
went last year to see an eruption on Vesuvius, not from the main crater, but from a small one which had risen up suddenly on the outside of it, and he gave me leave, when I told him that I was writing for children, to tell them what he saw. This new cone, he said, was about two hundred feet high, and perhaps eighty or one hundred feet across at the top. And as he stood below it, it was not safe to go up it, smoke rolled from its top, rosy pink below, from the glare of the cauldron, and above, faint greenish or bluish silver of indescribable beauty, from the light of the moon. But more, by good chance, the cone began to send out, not smoke only, but brilliant, burning stones. Each explosion, he says, was like a vast gerundol of rockets, with a noise such as rockets would make, like the waves on a beach, or the wind blowing through shrouds. The mountain was trembling the whole time, so it went on for two hours and more, sometimes eight or ten explosions in a minute, and more than a thousand stones in each, some as large as two bricks end to end. The largest ones mostly fell back into the crater, but the smaller ones, being thrown higher and more acted on by the wind, fell in immense numbers on the leeward slope of the cone, of course making it bigger and bigger, as I have explained already to you, and, of course, as they were intensely hot and bright, making the cone look as if it too was red-hot. But it was not so, he says, really. The color of the stones was rather golden, and they spotted the black cone over with their golden showers, the smaller ones stopping still, the bigger ones rolling down and jumping along just like hares. A wonderful pedestal, he says, for the explosion which surmounted it. How high the stones flew up he could not tell. There was generally one which went much higher than the rest, and pierced upwards towards the moon, who looked calmly down, mocking such vain attempts to reach her. The large stones, of course, did not rise so high, and some, he says, only just appeared over the rim of the cone, above which they came floating leisurely up, to show their brilliant forms an intense white light for an instant, and then subside again. Try and picture that to yourselves, remembering that this was only a little side eruption of no more importance to the whole mountain than the fall of a slate off the roof is of importance to the whole house. And then think how mean and weak man's fireworks and even man's heaviest artillery are compared with the terrible beauty and terrible strength of Madame Howe's artillery beneath our feet. Now look at this figure. It represents a section of a volcano, that is, one cut in half to show you the inside. A is the cone of cinders. B, the black line up through the middle, is the funnel or crack, through which steam, ashes, lava, and everything else rises. C is the crater mouth. D, 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 which looks broken, are the old rocks which the steam heaved up and burst before it could get out. And what are the black lines across, marked E, E, E? They are the streams of lava which have burrowed out, some covered up again in cinders, some lying bare in the open air, some still inside the cone, bracing it together, holding it up. Something like this is the inside of a volcano. End of section 4